Henry Hill's three decades in the mob is documented in the book Wise Guy, which later became Goodfellas. Here are five things you will love about Wise Guy. When Martin Scorsese read Nicholas Pileggi's book, he said, that's it. That's the story I'm looking for. He nails everything just right. What he was referring to was how it was growing up in Little Italy around wise guys in his youth. They were more like working class schlubs than the romanticized characters in movies like The Godfather. They were just working class stiffs like the rest of us, and that leads us to number one. Henry Hill, the perfect subject. In journalism, when covering an interest piece, there's a rule that you should interview people who are referred to as actors. Not actors in the theatrical sense, but actors in the context of individuals who are intimately involved in the subject you are covering. Say you're writing a piece on a chemical company that dumped a bunch of byproducts into a local river. If you got an interview with the president of the chemical company, that may look impressive, but it would actually be a pretty dull source since they will recite corporate boilerplate spiel and nothing that the public doesn't already know. You could talk to the truck driver who did the actual chemical dumping, but their knowledge would be very limited and not offer much insight. The president is too high and the driver is too low. But if you spoke to a retired chemical plant manager, you might get some valuable insight into what really went on. Those are the kind of actors that make a really good interview, and Henry Hill is that retired plant manager. He's the perfect subject. He's not a made man in the organization, but he also isn't a foot soldier. He's right in the meaty middle and seems to have his hands in everything, making him a subject with the perfect balance of knowledge and a willingness to share it. And if you want an example of a mafia book that does talk to the president of the company, check out Joe Bonanno's book. Yes, the head of the Bonanno family actually wrote an autobiography and if you like mafia books, it's actually quite disappointing. The reason why is because Bonanno never talks about his crimes and tries to convince us that he never did anything illegal. You get zero insight into the Bonanno crime family. He is the president of the chemical company trying to convince us that his corporation is a friend to the environment. He's the ultimate unreliable narrator. But back to Henry Hill, the retired plant manager. When he finally is busted by the FBI, the agents are shocked at what they have stumbled into. Could a guy who isn't a made man really be this close to someone like Paul Vario and have his hand in so many different racketeering ventures? Well, the answer turned out to be yes. And what a resume Henry Hill has. Number two, the sheer volume and variety of crime. When we think of organized crime, we think of illegal activities like gambling and union racketeering, but most of Paul Vario's crews were involved in simple theft. And what did they steal? Anything that wasn't nailed down. At a young age, Henry was a fence for stolen property from neighborhood kids. He moved counterfeit money around, then got into stolen cigarettes. One racket involved drilling holes in Christmas trees and putting branches in them to sell them for inflated prices. Henry had a job as a restaurant delivery unloader. His cronies would pull up in their cars and he'd dump food product into the back seat from the back of the truck. They could afford to buy the food, but they said the stolen food always tasted better. And then he was heavy into stolen credit cards. If you remember who Stax Edwards was, that was the guy who hooked him up with the stolen credit cards. Henry's biggest opportunity came when the Idlewild Golf Course was turned into Idlewild Airport and every piece of cargo coming through was fair game to the Lucazzi family. That's where they developed a system where many of the 50,000 airport employees would tip off the crew about certain high value cargo loads. And for Henry, stealing became life. To live otherwise was foolish. Anyone who stood waiting his turn on the American pay line was beneath contempt. Those who did, who followed the rules, were stuck in low-paying jobs, worried about their bills, put tiny amounts away for rainy days, kept their place and crossed off work days on their kitchen calendars like prisoners awaiting their release, could only be considered fools. They were timid, law-abiding, pension plan creatures, neutered by compliance, and awaiting their turns to die. To wise guys, working guys were already dead. Just so you know, I'm doing a book review of Fight Club. I think Henry Hill would have gotten along great with Tyler Durden. He was also a fence for the stolen jewelry of Estee Lauder. Yes, that Estee Lauder. She was actually a victim of home invasion by the Vario crew. They tied her up and stole a million dollars worth of her jewelry. It was Henry Hill who removed the stones from their settings, melted down the precious metals, and sold the jewels. He was involved in the Boston Point shaving scandal. After Henry was caught, he mentioned several trips to Boston over the years, and the FBI agent finally asked him why he went there, and he told him about the scheme. Understand, he didn't admit to it, he told the FBI agent about the scheme in casual conversation. As in, oh, that was just a business deal involving bribing players to miss points so we could cover the spread, but you're interested in real crimes, right? The FBI agent told Pileggi that his impression was that Henry Hill simply forgot that the point-shaving scheme was illegal. 
He had committed so many crimes over the years that he had forgotten which activities were legal and which ones were against the law. His admission to this crime was completely unintentional. Reading the book, it really was difficult to keep up with the sheer number of crimes these guys committed over the years. Eventually, through some dumb luck, Henry is pinched and forced to do real time, and that leads us to the number three thing you'll find interesting. Number three, prison time. I enjoyed Henry's recounting of the criminal justice system. He was arrested several times, but back then, racketeering charges were difficult. This was before the creation of the RICO Act. The legislatures of the state of New York had never gotten around to codifying the crime of hijacking. When caught, Hijackers had to be charged with other crimes, such as kidnapping, robbery, the possession of a gun, or possession of stolen property. Yes, somebody actually had to invent a new set of laws to deal with organized crime. In the pre-RICO Act days, if you ordered a murder, it was difficult to prosecute anyone except for the trigger man. A study on crime showed that 6,400 hijacking arrests during the 60s had resulted in only 30 state prison sentences. In one arrest, Henry recounts how his lawyer kept the case jumping around in courts for years, and eventually the charge ended with a $100 fine. When Henry recalls serving jail time for playing cards or stealing cigarettes, he typically only got a few weeks, and he describes how most of the guys don't view it as jail, but more of a temporary little vacation, and just part of doing business. Until now, all of his stints had been in jails, places like Rikers Island and Nassau County, places where wise guy inmates would spend a few casual months, usually on work release. For Henry and his crew, doing 30 or 60 days in jail was a little more than a temporary inconvenience. This was different. Prisons were forever. As Henry enters Lewisburg Prison in central Pennsylvania, he describes it as cold, wet, and gray, and having a foul stench. There are guard towers with machine guns, and the giant gate slams shut as he shuffles into the receiving room to get his rolled up mattress, sheets, and toothbrush. Then he sees Polly and his other associates standing right there laughing at him. At that point he realizes the prison is a ruse and everything will be all right. Henry goes to work immediately, bribing guards, bookmaking, and smuggling food in for all the wise guys. The amount of contraband these guys were able to get their hands on is amazing. He describes how you can get credit for good behavior at a rate of five days per month off your sentence. He's so specific that we imagine every day being counted and memorized all 3,650 days of his 10-year sentence. He's determined to get out as early as possible possible so that he can go back to what he loves, which is hijacking. Eventually he gets put on work detail at a dairy farm. Yes, Henry Hill was a dairy farmer for a few years. This affords him a huge amount of freedom. His voice is filled with enthusiasm as he explores all the new opportunities that prison is bringing. He's very somber as he describes getting caught, the trial, and the sentence, but in the next chapter, he sounds happy and chipper like this is the beginning of a golden era in crime. Henry works 17-hour days on the farm and he loves it. When he first meets the farmer, he notices he has a pony schedule and he realizes that as a degenerate gambler, he'll have no problem bribing this guy. His job involves inspecting the perimeter fence to see if any cows damaged it through the night. This isolation allows him to make pickups and delivery of contraband. He also has conjugal visits with Karen in the middle of a cornfield. Eventually, he gets a transfer to a white-collar prison and it really does sound like a Club Med experience. No walls, no cells. It was supposed to be like a summer camp for naughty grown-ups. There were tennis courts, a gym, jogging tracks, a nine-hole golf course, and best of all, extremely liberal and enlightened rehabilitation programs. At this summer camp is where Hill again proclaims his Jewish heritage and manages to get furloughs of seven days every three months for religious purposes. Apparently, if you're a Jewish, they just let you out every now and then. And of course, Henry is able to sniff out corrupt rabbis and use his religious furloughs to go to Atlantic City for gambling junkets. I really like the chapters on his prison experience because it mirrors the early parts of his life when he was just getting into the rackets. When one world closed on him, a whole new one opened. It just goes to show that a positive mental attitude is everything. As we fly through Henry's life, something sticks out to the reader from the opening pages of this book. Number four, the devil is in the details. The book really nails down the everyday life of the mafia. If you've seen the movie, and I know you have, you may wonder how Scorsese came up with all these minute details to make Henry's life so engaging. For example, remember when the big mob guy gets out of the car and the shot of the suspension pushing the car body up? That's actually from the book. And as you read on, you'll have several of these aha moments. The bartender getting a tip for keeping the ice cubes cold is in there. Wasting eight aprons on a guy's bullet wound is in there. Cutting garlic with a razor blade. Hiding your cross 
from your Jewish mother-in-law. The judge is handing out sentences like candy. Place got hit by lightning? F you, pay me. It's all in there. The Peters and Pauls, all married to girls named Marie. In the front and out the back. Entering the Copacabana through the kitchen. Not seeing over the steering wheel of a caddy. Even that damned lucky blue hat. It's all from the book. It's a testament to Pelleggi's writing to see that all the details made it into the movie. He did a good job of pulling these memories out of his subject, and it's what made Scorsese realize he discovered the perfect story. Number five, Henry's nostalgia. The way Henry Hill is finally caught was also through some dumb luck. An informant offers information on the Lucazzi family drug ring. Originally, it isn't even the FBI who finds this. It's the narcotics agents who stumble upon this opportunity. They turn it over to the FBI who promptly bug Henry's phone. The FBI is fascinated by Hill, fascinated by how many levels he's involved in, and the fact that he's a street guy who has everyday access to made guys like Paul Vario. They see him as a golden opportunity to bring the Lucazzi family down to their knees, and they move on him with immunity and witness protection. When Henry goes into the program, he knows his life is over. He reminisces with nostalgia about the heists, the rackets, the life, the money, the women, and being king of the city. And he still talked about Jimmy the Gent with affection, even though the guy was ready to kill him. He was the best teacher a guy could want. It was Jimmy who got me into cigarette bootlegging and hijackings. We buried bodies. We did Air France and Lufthansa. We got sentenced for 10 years for putting the arm on the guy in Florida. He was at the hospital when Karen had the kids. And we went to birthday parties and holidays at each other's houses. We did it all. And now maybe he was going to kill me. The author concludes, For Henry Hill, giving up the life was hard but giving up his friends was easy. You can feel Henry's pain in this book, the way he recounts the good old days. Even his time serving in prison, he recounts with nostalgia since he was on top of the world and doing what he loved most, just in a slightly different environment. The famous opening lines say it all. To me, being a wise guy was better than being president of the United States. It meant power among people who had no power. It meant perks in a working class neighborhood that had no privileges. To be a wise guy was to own the world. I dreamed about being a wise guy the way other kids dreamed about being doctors or movie stars or firemen or ball players. Henry died in 2012 of heart disease from a lifetime of smoking. He violated one last rule when he was in witness protection. He spoke to reporters and a writer about writing his autobiography. Considering it went on to become the greatest movie of the 90s, you can say with confidence that Henry Hill did not die a schnook after all. If you love the movie, you owe it to yourself to read the source material. That's it for this week. We have three great book reviews coming up. The Queen's Gambit, Fight Club, and Darkly Dreaming Dexter. Don't forget to check out my own book, Grand Portage, about a guy who buys a nuclear aircraft carrier. It's available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. Thanks for watching, and never stop reading. Stop reading.